here's Trey. All right, let's go over our core values. I am destined. I am effective. I am strong. I am teachable. I am intelligent. I am noble. I am yours, Lord. Who? Who? Know what time it is? It's time to hear a story full of wonder. There's so much fun we'll have learning together. So let's go down, go down to the clubhouse with Holly and his friends. Let's go down, down, down to the clubhouse where wonder never ends at the Wonder Clubhouse. Me and you at the Wonder Clubhouse. Me and you. Oh, hi there, friends. I'm Zoe, and I'm so happy to see you today. It is such a beautiful day outside. I wanted to practice going on my pogo stick, but I broke my arm. So I went to the part with my aunt. I felt so bouncy, like a kangaroo. I jumped and I jumped, and I saw beautiful flowers and big green trees. It was so pretty. Who? Who? It's Ollie! Hello, Zoe. Who? Ho! Jumping all around, are you? I am, Ollie. I got to see so many beautiful flowers at the park with my aunt. The park is lovely. It's true. I know an even more amazing place for you. Listen to this story. Just follow me through. Ho! Ho! Follow me through. Oh, hi, friends. Hola. <laughs> I'm Luis, the handyman. Today, I'm watering all the seeds I just planted in my little garden here. <laughs> I'm growing tomatoes right here. And over here, I'm planting strawberries. And then this spot is going to have peppers. Mmm, that is spicy. <laughs> You know, this garden reminds me of our story today. Do you want to help me build it? Great! All right, let's put it on the story fence. Hammers up, little builders. Ready? Uno, dos, tres, hammer! Great job, little helpers. You can put your hammers down. Now we just need our story tools. Yep, we have everything we need. Today's true story from the Bible begins in the very beginning, when God created the most perfect garden. It had big tree, beautiful flowers, and lots of plants. Some of them even had food on them. And there were so many animals. Look at this place. <laughs> I told you it was perfect, and God made it all. But he wasn't done. As beautiful and perfect as the garden was, God knew it needed his most amazing creation. So God made people. <laughs> he called the man Adam. Now wave to the kids, Adam. And the woman was called Eve. Now the garden truly was perfect. God gave Adam an important job to do. God told him to name all the animals and take care of them. Let's see if you know the names of these animals. Ready? Uh, what's this guy's name? <laughs> yeah, a frog, that's right. <laughs> okay, who is this? <laughs> yes, it's a bunny rabbit. <laughs> okay, now, this one is harder. Ready? What's his name? <laughs> yes, he's a kangaroo. Boinky, boinky. <laughs> Great job. So Adam and Eve lived in God's wonderful garden. And they knew that God's way is perfect. They could eat fruit from any of the trees, except for one. In fact, that was the only rule. God told them to never, ever, ever, 
never eat that one fruit. Oh no! What are they doing? Is Eve going to eat the fruit? Everybody say, oh no! Ready? Oh no! <gasps> no! Eve ate the fruit! Wait! Now what is she doing? She's handing it to Adam. Everybody say, oh no! Ready? Oh no! No! They both ate the fruit. They disobeyed God. And because they didn't do the things God's way, God had to send them away from his beautiful garden. God still loved Adam and Eve very much. They still had food to eat and animals to take care of, but everything was a lot harder. It would have been so much better if they had followed God's way. Because remember, God's way is perfect. When God wants you to do something, remember, His way is perfect. So jump, jump, and go God's way. Hey there, Holly. Tell me, whose way is perfect? God's way is perfect. Yes, it's true. Now let's hear it from you. Tell me, whose way is perfect? God's way is perfect. That's the truth, friends. You better believe it. Adios! <laughs> So there's your story, and it's all true. God made a beautiful garden, because his way is perfect. Ho, ho. Thanks, Ollie. Goodbye to you. Ho, ho. It's amazing. God made such a beautiful garden. It was perfect, because God's way is perfect. I think I got the story. Did you get it? If you did, say got it. You get it? Got it! Good! I'm going to jump around outside and go find more beautiful things God made. I'll see you next time. Bye! God's way is perfect. 2 Samuel 22:31. God's way is perfect. 2 Samuel 22:31. Have you ever decided to do something really big? Like, learn how to play guitar. Or, uh, oh, make friends with the new kid down the street. Maybe you even want to bake a master chef-worthy cake for your mom's birthday. You're super excited to get started, but then you sit down with the guitar and... Oh, no. Or you spend all morning working up the nerve to go knock on the new kid's door and... It turns out he's gone for a week of summer camp. Then you find the recipe for that amazing cake, and it's crazy. Doing big things takes work. It takes making a plan and then sticking with it. There are calluses along the way, patience and courage in building a friendship, and definitely some mess. But when you follow through, you find the music, you grow a friendship, you create amazing edible art. And through it all, others can see how God has given you the strength to stick with it. That's why commitment is an amazing way to worship God with your life. Because worship is about more than just singing loud. It's all about living loud. Hey, 
America and I'm training for a 5k race as you can see I've been training all day so as my grandma would say I'm a little glowy if you've ever run a 5k you know it takes a lot more than popping off a couch and putting your running shoes on okay it takes commitment commitment is making a plan and putting it into practice and my plan is not just running around a lot i mean i've got to train and what i'm calling the three s's speed strength smarts so there's running yes but i'm also working on my strength and running takes a lot out of you Your body's gonna wanna give up. Ow. But I'm going to train my brain to keep running the race no matter what. Like right now, my body is telling me not to eat this kale because it looks gross. But my brain tells me that kale is good for giving my body energy. So here goes. Come on, brain. Eat. I can't do it. I can't Maybe I can find some easier ways to train my brain. In today's story, the Apostle Paul wrote about training for a different kind of race. No kale involved. <laughs> what? No, 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 no! The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 24 through 25. Did you know that some writers of the Bible talk sports? Well, not every sport, but at least one that you are familiar with. Yep, running. Running has been around ever since, well, since God created people. In fact, the Apostle Paul uses running as an example in one of his letters to the church in Corinth. In a race, all the runners run. But only one gets the prize. You know that, don't you? So run in a way that will get you the prize. Now, Paul is talking about more here than just running, but first you have to understand what it takes to run a long race. Let's say you want to run a marathon. That's 26.2 miles. <laughs> There's no way you can just hop up off the sofa where you've been playing video games for months and run that far. So you need a plan. When I was preparing for my first marathon, <clears throat> I found this plan. I started training more than four months ahead of the race, and I started with just a few miles at a time. Once you've got a plan, well, then you gotta move. That means short runs, long runs, and cross training to work other muscles and prevent injury. Next up, you've got to fuel. Plenty of water, of course. Plus, you need healthy carbs for your long runs like bananas. And maybe some spaghetti and meatballs. Mmm. Mmm. What's the last part of your training? Get ready for it. Rest. <sighs> if you don't rest and let your body recover, you'll get burnt out or injured. The last few days before a marathon, you don't even run at all. Oh, <sighs> yeah. Running a long race is no joke. But Paul says what we're doing right now, you and me, is even more important. All who take part in the games train hard. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So I do not run like someone who doesn't run toward the finish line. I do not fight like a boxer who hits nothing but air. Paul packs a lot of weight into just a few sentences. Whether you planned it or not, we are all running a race right now. 
Okay, so that's a little crazy. Clearly, I'm standing here talking to you, and you aren't outside running laps either. But Paula is talking about a way of life, a journey. We're all focused on the finish line, life forever with Jesus. But in the meantime, every step along the way is important as we live out what matters most. Jesus reminded his followers, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Love him with all your mind. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yep, love God, love others. That's what matters on this journey together. But just like you can't skip from jogging one lap around the school gym to running a 26.2 mile race, you're gonna need some practice. Your Love God, Love Others Marathon needs a training plan. Now, none of us have it all figured out, but here are four important things to start with. In fact, you may already be doing some of them. First point, hear. God is the master teller of this amazing story. He's the author of this whole race, so the most important thing is learning to hear from God. That means digging into God's word and hearing the stories and wisdom from people who walked with him. You can also hear from God from people around you in your life who know and follow him. Now, here's the second step in training for our Love God, Love Others Marathon. Pray. Okay, when you hear pray, you might think, Truth is, you don't need fancy words to pray. You can talk to God anytime, anywhere, about anything, just like talking to your mom or your best friend. Now let's take a look at point three in our training plan, talk. Hello out there! Tell other people what God has been up to in your life, what's changing, how you're learning to love others better. And here's the final point in your Love God, Love Others training plan. Live. Live for God. Let his love fill up every part of your life, at home, at school, at church, even when your dad makes you stop reading your book to play a game with your little sister. Hear, pray, talk, live. That's how you practice loving God and loving others. As Paul wrote, so run in a way that will get you the prize. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. And when you do, you will live out Paul's wisdom to the Corinthians and win the race. <sighs> when the Apostle Paul wrote about running a race, it was about way more than a 5K. It was about life because sometimes life can feel like a race. That's why we've got to train. We need to make a commitment to practice what matters most. Jesus taught that what matters most is to love God and love others. How do you do that? Well, you can start with these four words. Hear, pray, talk, and live. Hear, hear from God, pray, pray to God, talk, talk about God, live, live for God. In the race of life, you can't always rely on your own strength. <laughs> You'll need God's help and wisdom to keep running. It's not always going to be easy. You may even want to give up, but it's better to keep going because loving God and loving others is the most important thing you will ever do. Here's the one thing to remember today. Keep practicing what matters most, loving God and loving others. This may come natural to you, or it may seem totally new. Whatever the case, just commit to training a little bit every day. It'll be good for you. I guess if I commit to training, I need to do what's good for me and try a little bit of kale. Hey, that's not bad. I feel more energetic already. Oh yeah. Here we go. I'm ready. And I'm a fan of kale. Bye. My name is Nick. I grew up in Shawnee, a small town in Oklahoma. My mom, she was a teacher and my dad would help out with our oil field business. When I was growing up, my family did a lot of like vacations and game nights and we're just very connected with each other.
When I was in fifth grade, my mom and dad came in and told me and my brother to go to the living room. So they sat me and my brother down and just told us that they weren't going to be living in the same house and we're going to be seeing other people. When they got divorced, I felt really lonely and hopeless, felt like it was all my fault and that like it just drew me away from like feeling loved like I didn't want to feel loved I felt like I could never feel loved and so I just kind of distanced myself from everyone I wouldn't have time to sit down and think about what was going on in my mind so just really emotionally disconnected from myself that way I could still like feel a little bit happy I started attending Switch in eighth grade and I made a few friends in my small group that really were really intentional and held me accountable in growing my faith. Coming to know Jesus was really an emotional roller coaster because like you're told that you're never alone, but at the time like I really felt alone. Like when I would just sit down and think, like it felt like no one was there for me. So my small group leader and freshman year actually was more of a father figure to me and would teach me about God and how to be a Christian. And I, I also got connected with my youth pastor, Tanner, who really helped me get connected with the church and meet new people and grow in my faith with God. I was happy again and felt like I had a community that I could just grow with. When I start feeling alone, I tend to run to my youth pastor and my friends in my small group, and then just reading the Bible constantly and praying like, God, are you here? Like, can I feel you? If you're ever feeling alone, I really encourage you to find the friends, your family, the community, your youth pastor, anyone that you can talk to and talk about your feelings because you never want to just hold everything in. Just know that you're not alone. Your friends are there. God's there. You have community that you can talk to and express those feelings with. My name's Nick, and this is my story. <laughs>